The king, dear Sona, wants to see your feet. Episode 246, Tipitaka, Part 162, in which we will continue reading the Tipitaka. Now, some of you might be thinking, why is he pronouncing Tripitaka in such a strange way? Tipitaka is the original name. Uh, that's Pali language. Tripitaka is Sanskrit. There you go. Uh, both of which mean three baskets, referring to the uh, basically the books behind me, the original, obviously, texts that were translated uh, into the books behind me. The books behind me are the uh, complete Tipitaka from the Pali Text Society. <laughs> Polytext Society. Um, and uh, if you'd like your own set, you can uh, just search for Polytext Society. I believe it's pts.org. Or um, alternately, you can go to the Internet Archive if they're back online. I know they were doing some kind of maintenance with their server recently, but uh, it's all on there too. Um, or you can follow Buddhist Books Podcast, and I have uh, committed to read the entire thing. We're halfway through with the fourth book, so it, it'll take a little while. Um, so this is Mahavaga 5, Part 1. Mahavaga means Great Division. It comes after Bhikkhuni Vibhanga, which is the Rules for Duns, which comes after um, the Rules for Monks. I'll just get to it. Sometimes I talk too much in the intro, so today I'll be different and get to the reading. This is, oh, if you want to start at the beginning of the TV talk, you can click right there. Okay. The Great Division, Mahavaga 5. At one time, the Awakened One, the Lord was staying at Rajagaha on Mount Vulture Peak. Now at that time, King Saniya Bimbisara of Magad um, ruled with supreme authority over 80,000 villages. Now at that time, at Kampa, a merchant's son called Sona Kolivisa was delicately nurtured and down came to have grown on the soles of his feet. Hmm. Oh, okay. All right. It happens. Like down, like soft uh, pre-feathers of birds. I think that's what it's saying. Okay. Then King Senia Bimbisara of Magad. Having had those 80,000 village overseers convened, sent a messenger to Sona Kolivisa on some business, saying, quote, Let Sona come. I want Sona to come. As you can see, there's a, a cartoon character next to me, unless you're on the audio only version. If you're on the. Um, audio-only version. I believe it's Mufasa from The Lion King. He represents King Senia Bimbisara of Magad on Buddhist Books Podcast, just to kind of help make it fun and to give a little, because there's a lot of names. Uh, here's just an image that, that was from the uh, Tipitaka Rogues Gallery. Now, most of those characters are um, monks and nuns that 
did naughty things, and that resulted in new rules being created. Uh, but it's, he's, they're introducing a new character here, so I'm inclined to say, let's go ahead and give them a form. And the form is this. Now, I, sitting here, speaking to you now, have no idea what that form is, but it's on my right now, your left as you're facing me. We get a little silly here sometimes. Hope you don't mind. <clears throat> okay. Then, and I think I'm going to need the magnifying glass. Then, Sona Colivisa's much better parents spoke thus to Sono, Sona Colivisa. Quote, the king, dear Sona, wants to see your feet. This sort of thing happens, of course. Anyway, do not you, dear Sona, stretch out your feet towards the king. Sit down cross-legged in front of the king, and as you are sitting down, the king will see your feet. End quote. Then they sent Sona Colivisa away in a palaquin. Um, I... Uh, had to recently learn what a palaquin is. Here's an image of a palaquin. It's one of those things that you carry people around in. They're not as popular these days, but now you know, if you didn't know before. I know at least one person who will watch this one day will be like, a what? Now you know, that's a palaquin. Okay, then Sona Kolivisa approached the king Senia Bimbisara of Magad. Having approached, having greeted King Senia Bimbisara of Magad, he sat down cross-legged in front of the king. So, King Senia Bimbisara of Magad saw the down that was growing on the soles of Sona Kolivisa's feet. Then King Senia Bimbisara of Magad Having instructed those 80,000 village overseers in matters concerning this world, dismissed them, saying, quote, You, good sirs, are now instructed by me in matters concerning this world. Go along, pay homage to this Lord, and our Lord will instruct you in transcendental matters. End quote. Very likely he's referring to Lord Buddha in this context. Then those 80,000 village overseers approached Mount Vulture's Peak. Now at that time, the venerable Sagata was the Lord's attendant. Um, let's, uh, let's give Sagata a form. And uh, we'll put him here beside... Uh, you know, the one with the feet, uh, Sona Colibisa. It's going to get a little crowded if they start naming more people. Okay. Um, then those 80,000 village overseers approached the venerable Sagata. Having approached, they spoke thus to the venerable Sagata. Quote, honored sir. These 80,000 village overseers are approaching here to see the Lord. It were good, honored sirs, if we might have a chance to see the Lord. End quote. Quote, well then, do you, venerable ones, remain here for a moment until I have let the Lord know. End quote. Then the venerable Sagata, having stepped down from the moonstone, parentheses, step, and parentheses, in front of the 80,000 watching village overseers, having stepped up in front of the Lord, spoke thus to the Lord, quote, Lord. These 80,000 village overseers are approaching here to see the Lord, Lord. Does the Lord think it is now the right time for this? End quote. Quote, Well then, do you, Sagata, make a seat ready in the shade of the dwelling place? End quote. 
quote, very well, Lord, end quote, and the venerable Sagata, having answered the Lord in assent, having taken a chair, having stepped down from in front of the Lord, having stepped up on the moonstone, parentheses, step and parentheses, in front of the 80,000 village, excuse me, watching village overseers, made ready a seat in the shade of the dwelling place. Then the Lord, having issued from the dwelling place, sat down on the seat made ready in the shade of the the dwelling place. <clears throat> then those 80,000 village overseers approached the Lord. Having approached, having greeted the Lord, they sat down at a respectful distance. Then those 80,000 village overseers paid respect only to the venerable Sagata, not likewise to the Lord. Then the Lord, knowing by reasoning of mind the minds of those 80,000 village overseers, addressed the venerable Sagata, saying, quote, Well then, do you, Sagata, abundantly show a state of further men, a wonder of psychic power? End quote. Quote, Very well, Lord. End quote. And the venerable Sagata, having answered the Lord in assent, having risen above the ground, paced up and down in the air, in the atmosphere. And he stood, and he sat down, and he lay down, and he smoked, and he blazed, and then he vanished. Then the venerable Sagata, having shown in the air, in the atmosphere, various states of further men and wonders of psychic power, having inclined his head towards the Lord's feet, spoke thus to the Lord, quote, Lord, the Lord is my teacher. I am a disciple, Lord. The Lord is my teacher. I am a disciple. End quote. He said it twice. I didn't accidentally repeat the same line twice, if you were wondering. Then those 80,000 village overseers, saying, quote, Indeed, it is marvelous. Indeed, it is wonderful that even a disciple can be of such great psychic power, of such great might, what must the teacher be? End quote. Paid respect only to the Lord, not likewise to the venerable Sagata. Then the Lord, knowing by reasoning of mind the minds of those 80,000 village overseers, talked a progressive talk. Now, of course, progressive in the 6th century before Common Era might not be exactly the same as progressive today. I'll just keep reading. That is to say, talk on giving, talk on moral habit, talk on heaven. He explained the peril, the vanity, the depravity of pleasures of the senses, the advantage in renouncing, parentheses them, end parentheses, when the Lord knew that their minds were ready, malleable, devoid of the hindrances, uplifted, pleased. Then he explained to them that teaching on Dhamma, which the awakened ones have themselves discovered, ill, uprising, stopping, the way. And as a clean cloth without black specks will easily take dye, even so, as those 80,000 village overseers were, parentheses, sitting, and parentheses, on that very seat, Dhamma vision, dustless, stainless, arose that, quote, whatever is of the nature to uprise, all that is of the nature to stop. 
these, having seen Dhamma, attained Dhamma, known Dhamma, plunged into Dhamma, having crossed over doubt, having put away uncertainty, having attained without another's help to full confidence in the teacher's instruction, spoke thus to the Lord, quote, excellent Lord, it is excellent Lord, just as Lord, one should set up right, excuse me, one should set up right what has been upset or should uncover what is covered, or should point out the way to one who is astray, or should bring a lamp into the darkness, so that those with eyes might see forms. Even so is Dhamma explained in many a figure by the Lord. We, Lord, are those going to the Lord for refuge, to Dhamma, and to the order of monks. May the Lord receive us as lay followers gone for refuge on this day for as long as life lasts." End quote. Then it occurred to Sona Koli Visa, you remember him, this one over here, um, quote, insofar as I understand Dhamma, taught by the Lord. It is not easy for those who live in a house to lead the Brahma faring that is wholly complete, wholly pure, and polished like a conch shell. What now if I, having cut off <clears throat> hair and beard, having donned yellow robes, should go forth from home into homelessness? <clears throat> End quote. Then those 80,000 village overseers, delighted with the Lord's speech, having given thanks for it, having risen from the seat, having greeted the Lord, departed, keeping their right sides towards him. Then Sona Kolivisa, soon after those 80,000 village overseers had departed, approached the Lord. Having approached Having greeted the Lord, he sat down at a respectful distance. As he was sitting down at a respectful distance, Sona Kolivisa spoke thus to the Lord, quote, Insofar as I, Lord, understand Dhamma taught by the Lord, it is not easy for those who live in a house to lead the Brahma faring that is wholly complete, wholly pure, and polished like a conch shell. I want, Lord, having cut off hair and beard, having donned yellow robes, to go forth from home into homelessness. Lord, may the Lord let me go forth. End quote. So, Sona Kolivisa received the going forth in the Lord's presence. He received ordination. And soon after he was ordained, the venerable Sona stayed in the cool grove. Because of his great output of energy and pacing up and down, his feet broke. The place for pacing up and down in became stained with blood as though there had been slaughter of cattle. Then, as the venerable Sona was meditating in private, a reasoning arose in his mind thus, quote, Those who are the Lord's disciples dwell putting forth energy. I am one of these, yet my mind is not freed from the cankers with no grasping. And moreover, there are my family's possessions. It might be possible to enjoy... Did I skip a page? Okay. It might be possible to enjoy the possessions and to do good. Suppose that I, having returned to the low life, should enjoy the possessions and should do good. End quote. Then the Lord, knowing by mind the venerable Sona's reasoning of mind, 
as a strong man might outstretch might stretch out his bent arm or might bend back his outstretched arm so did he vanishing from mount vulture peak appear in the cool grove then the lord touring the lodgings together with several monks approached the venerable sona's place for pacing up and down in the lord saw that the venerable sona's place for pacing up and down in was stained with the blood and seeing parentheses this and parentheses he addressed the monks saying quote, now why monks is this place for pacing up and down in stained with blood as though there has been slaughter of cattle and quote Quote, Lord, because of the venerable Sona's great energy in pacing up and down, his feet broke. And this place for pacing up and down in is stained with his blood, as though there had been slaughter of cattle. End quote. <clears throat> then the Lord approached the venerable Sona's dwelling place. And having approached, he sat, sat down on an appointed seat. And the venerable Sona having greeted the Lord, sat down at a respectful distance. The Lord spoke thus to the venerable Sona as he was sitting at a respectful distance. Quote, Sona, as you were meditating in private, did not a reasoning arise in your mind like this? Quote within quotes, those who are the Lord's disciples dwell, putting forth energy, three dots. It's all the stuff that already was said earlier. According in parentheses, it says that. I assume. Three dots. Suppose that I, having returned to the low life, should enjoy the possessions and should do good, end quote, within quotes, end quote. Quote, yes, Lord, end quote. <clears throat> Quote, what do you think about this, Sona? Were you clever at the lute's stringed music when formerly you were a householder? End quote. Quote, yes, Lord. End quote. Quote, what do you think about this, Sona, when the strings of your lute were too taut? Was your lute at that time tuneful and fit for playing? End quote. Quote, no, indeed, Lord. End quote. What do you think about this, Sona? When the strings of your lute were too slack? Was your lute at that time tuneful and fit for playing? End quote. Polytech Society. You forgot the opening quote in that one. Typo. Just saying. Quote. No, indeed, Lord. End quote. Quote. What do you think about this, Sona? When the strings of your lute were neither too taut nor too slack, but were keyed to an even pitch, was your lute at that time tuneful and fit for playing? End quote. Quote, yes, Lord. End quote. Quote, even so, Sona, does too much output of energy conduce to restlessness? Does too feeble energy conduce to slothfulness? Therefore do you, Sona, determine upon evenness in energy and pierce the evenness of the faculties and reflect upon it. End quote. Quote, yes, Lord. End quote. The venerable Sona answered the Lord in assent. Then the Lord, having exhorted the venerable Sona with, it, with this exhortation, as a strong man might stretch out his bent arm or might bend back his outstretched arm. So did he, vanishing from in front of the venerable Sona in the cool grove, appear on Mount Vulture Peak. After that, the venerable Sona determined upon evenness in energy, and he pierced the evenness of the faculties and reflected upon it. Then the venerable Sona, dwelling alone, aloof, earnest, ardent, self-resolute, having soon realized here and now by his own super-knowledge that supreme goal of the Brahma faring for the sake of which young men of family rightly go forth from home into homelessness, 
abided in it, and he understood. Destroyed is birth. Lived in is the Brahma fairing. Done is what has to be done. There is no more of being such and such. And so the venerable Sona became one of the perfected ones. It's nice to see this uh, allegory of the string being too tight, uh, you know, not being able to be played or, or breaking, and the string being too loose, not making any sound. Uh, I think for the first time in the Tibitaka, uh, of course, I first heard it in the, uh, the movie called Little Buddha, uh, starring Keanu Reeves as Lord Buddha. If you tighten the string too much, it will snap. And if you leave it too slack, it won't play. Suddenly, Siddhartha realized that these simple words held a great truth. When the venerable Sona had attained perfection, it occurred to him, quote, suppose I were to declare profound knowledge in the Lord's presence, end quote. Then the venerable Sona approached the Lord. Having approached, having greeted the Lord, he sat down at a respectful distance. As he was sitting down at a respectful distance, the venerable Sona spoke thus to the Lord. Quote, Lord, that monk who is one perfected, who has destroyed the cankers, lived the life, done what was to be done, shed the burden, won his own goal, destroyed utterly the fetter of becoming, and is wholly freed by profound knowledge. He comes to be intent upon six matters. He comes to be intent upon renunciation. He comes to be intent upon aloofness. He comes to be intent upon non-harming. He comes to be intent upon the destruction of grasping. He comes to be intent upon the destruction of craving. He comes to be intent upon non-confusion. Perhaps, Lord, one of the venerable ones here might think, quote, then quotes, could it be that this venerable one is intent upon renunciation depending upon mere faith alone? End quote, then quotes. But this Lord is not to be regarded thus. Lord, the monk who has destroyed the cankers, has lived the life, done what was to be done, not seeing aught in himself, to be done or to be added to what has been done, being passionless comes to be intent on renunciation because of the destruction of passion. Being without hatred comes to be intent on renunciation because of the destruction of hatred. Being without confusion comes to be intent on renunciation because of the destruction of confusion. Perhaps, Lord, one of the venerable ones here might think, quote, then quotes, could it be that this venerable one is intent upon aloofness while hankering after gains, honor, fame, end quote, then quotes. But this Lord is not to be regarded thus, Lord. The monk who has destroyed the cankers, three dots, or to be added to what has been done, being passionless, comes to be intent upon aloofness, because of the destruction of passion, 
being without hatred, three dots. Polytech society doesn't like us to experience reading things so much as just kind of yeah, get the point, get the point across. You can figure it out. Just look back. It's basically the same stuff he said before. That's one of the disagreements I have with the Polytech Society. I wish they wouldn't do that. We'll do our best. <clears throat> Being without confusion comes to be intent on aloofness because of the destruction of confusion. Perhaps, Lord. One of the venerable ones here might think, quote within quotes, could it be that this venerable one is intent on non-harming, is backsliding from the essence to the contagion of habit and custom, and quote within quotes. But this Lord is not to be regarded thus. Lord, the monk who has, who has destroyed the cankers, three dots, or to be added to what has been done. Being passionless comes to be intent on non-harming because of the destruction of passion. Being without hatred, three dots. Being without confusion comes to be intent on non-harming because of the destruction of confusion. Being passionless, he comes to be intent on the destruction of grasping because of the destruction of passion. Being without hatred, he comes to be intent on the destruction of grasping because of the destruction of hatred. Being without confusion, he comes to be intent on the destruction of grasping because of the destruction of confusion. Being passionless, he comes to be intent on the destruction of craving because of the destruction of passion. Being without hatred, he comes to be intent on the destruction of craving because of the destruction of hatred. Being without confusion, he comes to be intent on the destruction of craving because of the destruction of confusion. Being passionless, he comes to be intent on non-confusion because of the destruction of passion. Being without hatred, he comes to be intent on non-confusion because of the destruction of hatred. Being without confusion, he comes to be intent on non-confusion because of the destruction of confusion. Thus, Lord, even if shapes cognizable by the eye come very strongly into the field of vision of a monk whose mind is wholly freed, they do not obsess the mind, for his mind comes to be undefiled, firm, one to exposure. And he notes it's, excuse me, pages. He notes it's passing, hence, if sounds cognizable by the ear, three dots, if sense cognizable by the nose, three dots, if tastes cognizable by the tongue, three dots, if touches cognizable by the body, three dots, if mental objects cognizable by the mind, come very strongly into the field of thought of a monk whose mind is wholly freed. They do not obsess his mind, for his mind comes to be undefiled, firm, one to composure, and he notes its passing hence. It is as if, Lord, there were a rocky mountain slope without a cleft, without a hollow of one mass, and as if wild wind and rain should come very strongly from the eastern quarter, it would neither tremble nor quake nor shake violently, and as if wild wind and rain should come very strongly from the western quarter, three dots, from the northern quarter, three dots, from the southern quarter, it would neither tremble nor quake nor shake violently. Even so, Lord, if shapes cognizable by the eye come very strongly into the field of vision of a monk whose mind is wholly freed, three dots. If mental objects cognizable by the mind come very strongly into the field of thought of a monk whose mind is wholly freed, they do not obsess his mind, for his mind comes to be undefiled, firm, one to exposure, and he notes its passing hence. End quote. Okay. 
If one is intent upon renunciation and mind's aloofness, if one is intent upon non-harming and destruction of grasping, if one is intent upon destruction of craving and mind's non-confusion, having seen sensations rise, his mind is wholly freed. For that monk whose mind is calmed and wholly freed, there is nothing to add to what has been done, there is naught to be done. As a rock of one mass by wind is never moved, so shapes, tastes, sounds, scents, touches, and all pleasant and unpleasant mental objects stir not a man like this. His mind is firm, well freed, and he notes its passing hence. There's a little more to this section, so we'll just finish this section. Then the Lord addressed the monks, saying, quote, Thus, monks, do young men of family declare profound knowledge. The goal is spoken, but the self is not obtruded. But then it seems to me that there are some foolish men here who declare profound knowledge for fun. These afterwards come to disaster. Quote. Then the Lord addressed the venerable Sona, saying, quote, You, Sona, have been delicately nurtured. I allow for you, Sona, sandals with one lining. End quote. Is this the beginning of sandals in the original Sangha? Hm. But they were barefoot this whole time? Okay. Interesting. Okay, um, quote, but I, Lord, gave up 80 cartloads of gold when I went forth from home into homelessness and a herd of seven elephants. Because of this, there will be speakers against me saying, quote, unquote, Sona Koli Visa gave up 80 cartloads of gold when he went forth from home into homelessness and a herd of seven elephants and now this very parentheses person and parentheses is clinging on to sandals with one lining. End quote, end quote. He's, this is Sona quoting the hypothetical monks who will tease him for being a rich kid who gets to wear sandals. If the Lord will allow them to the order of monks, I too will make use of them. He's saying, hey. Don't just let me alone have sandals. Let all the monks have sandals. Fair request. Um, but if the Lord will not allow them to the order of monks, neither will I make use of them. And quote, Then the Lord, on this occasion, having given reasons talk, addressed the monks, saying, quote, Monks, I allow sandals with one lining. Monks, doubly lined sandals should not be worn. Trebly lined sandals, trebly lined? Okay. Uh, should, I'm guessing, not be worn? Not be worn. Sandals with many linings should not be worn. Whoever should wear, parentheses, any of these, end parentheses, there is an offense of wrongdoing. End quote. And that concludes uh, today's reading. And today was fun. Um, the, the origin story of sandals among the original Sangha of Lord Buddha. So if you're a monk or a nun, and you were wearing sandals, now you know the story behind that. And uh, special thanks to all of our uh, special guests who helped tell that story today. And uh, okay, till next time, <clears throat> talking to them. Okay, well, if anybody um, is new, welcome. 
Um, and feel free to click through to the, the main page and, uh, of course, click subscribe. If you don't mind, uh, go ahead and click like on this uh, video as well. It just helps the algorithm to uh, know that it should show this video to more people. So I'm assuming if you made it all the way to the end that maybe you enjoyed it. If not, then of course don't click like. I'm not, not telling you to do anything that you don't want to do. Not intending to anyway. And um, yeah, on that main page, um, you'll find many playlists. The Tipitaka of Presectarian Early Buddhism, as well as uh, Vajrayana, Tibetan Buddhism, Padmasambhava, uh, Zen Buddhism, Shingon Buddhism. Uh, we even dive a little bit into the Jayan Sutras. There's a lot of lot of lot of uh, content for you to discover. Okay, I will go ahead and do the usual closing. This is the prayer that concluded the morning uh, meditations that I used to do with my father when I was very young, and it goes like this: To the north and to the south, to the east and to the west, to the spirits of light among us and to the spirits below. We send out our reverent love and compassion. May all beings be happy. May all beings be serene. May all beings be in peace. Oh. Until next time.